Welcome to a brand new series bringing you the very best car stories from mainland Europe, the most diverse piece of motoring real estate on the planet. In this episode, Tom Ford's in Iceland trying out one of the world's maddest motorsports, Formula Off-Road. Car journalist Giga Collier drives the latest Rolls-Royce, the majestic Phantom Coupe. I'll be bringing you the highlights from the world's biggest car event, the Moscow Motor Show. And touring car driver Tim Schrick finds out if the new Audi TTS is finally a car to beat the Porsche Cayman on the track. Oh, I love it. Did you know that Iceland is virtually pollution free? It's powered almost exclusively by geothermal and hydroelectric energy, so it doesn't pump out noxious fossil fuel gases out into the atmosphere. It was also one of the first countries to introduce hydrogen filling stations, which reduces vehicle emissions. That probably makes them feel less guilty about having toys like that. This hulking off-road buggy weighs well over a tonne, but thanks to a 750 PS Chevy V8, it gets to 100 kilometers an hour in just 3.5 seconds. It's a formula off-roader, and let loose in Iceland's stunning volcanic landscape, it's giving me the passenger ride of my life. It's basically a very simple sport. All you've got to do is find a hill like this one and climb to the top. <laughs> During the competition, the hill is covered in gates. The further up you get, the more points you earn. If you hit a gate, stop or rest the rover, then you lose points. And a normal competition is about six or eight hills. There are different classes, but my driver, Gunnar Gunnarsson, competes in the Daddy, the unlimited class. He's been the Icelandic champion six times and world champion four times, so it's safe to say he's quite good at it. It's basically like drag racing up a vertical cliff face. The acceleration is phenomenal. I've never experienced anything like that. It just grips and goes, but it's spitting rocks everywhere. And Gunny is just a master. I think he's trying to send me mad. Bloody hell! This will bring you a breakfast up. This is the best thing I've ever done in my life. I'm going to have bruises in the morning. Gunner, that was absolutely incredible. But you are insane, I oh. think. This is your competition car, right? In the unlimited class. Yeah. So that means that you can have these massive paddle sort of tires and they really dig in yeah. to the to the ground, don't they? They are called bigger digger. Bigger diggers. Yeah, and those here in the back they are called super scoopers. <laughs> bigger diggers and super scoopers. Yeah. Is it dangerous? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think in uh, about 30 or 40 years in Iceland, uh, I think it's only be two or three uh, minor, one break of leg or one hurt back. Which is pretty hard to believe when you look at some of this. A few years ago, we didn't have the top, just have net. Yeah, nice. and, yeah, and uh, when we were in like this gravel here, yeah, it was very soft. And when they rolled down, and it, the guy was like this in the car, <laughs> so it was not very good. Then they make the rule to put the top on. Okay, okay. Yeah. Can I have a go? Yeah, of course. Oh, god! I was hoping you wouldn't say that. <laughs> Okay, Gunnar, so how do I drive it? Just step on it. It's very easy to drive, as you can feel. The steering's quite light. Yeah. Just go straight up. Up there. Yeah. Now, apparently, I wasn't using the car to its full potential. Come on, you can do better than this. Don't drive like a lady. Step on it. 
Gunner decided to give me a little bit of encouragement by grabbing my leg and pushing it hard down on the accelerator. <laughs> That was incredible! This thing just immense! But then I started getting carried away, and even though I was under strict instructions not to drive up the big hill, I couldn't resist trying to jump the car, which got me into trouble. Are, are you going to try to kill me or what? Huh? That's enough. Yeah, finish. You're, you're, you're crazy. <laughs> I think we're finished for the day. Yeah, I think we are. Thank you, Gunnar, that was awesome. That was scary. <laughs> this five million euro villa sits in the heart of France's idyllic Provence region. It's a playboy's paradise with ultra modern styling. If you could ever bear to drag yourself away from it, you'd want to make sure that your car had the same qualities. So you might well buy this, the 400,000 euro Rolls-Royce Phantom Coupe. With just two doors, it's shorter than a normal Phantom, with a lower center of gravity, visible exhaust and a redesigned front, all to emphasize the fact that for the first time this is a sporty rather than stately roller. It's usually at this point that I tell you about the characteristics of the engine, but there's almost no point. Despite the fact I can get to 100 km per hour in 5.8 seconds and go on to hit 250 top speed with ease, it feels like the engine isn't there. It does the job of silently shifting you along at any rate of speed perfectly. It uses the usual 6.75 liter V12 you get in the Phantom and produces 459 PS and a massive 720 Newton meters of torque. But really, if you're obsessed by the numbers, then this isn't the car for you. All you want to do is shift along as quickly as possible without ever sounding stressed or making your passengers drop the caviar from the back of their hands. With 75% of the power available at just 1000 RPM, nothing is strained. Look, I have a power reserve needle. 90% of my power is still unused. Brilliant! You could just floor the throttle to access all that power in reserve, but before you do, you'll need to know that this Rolls Royce has a dirty little secret. I don't know if there was a mix up at the factory, but there seems to be a sport button here. I'm not sure if I even want to press it. I'm in a Rolls Royce and I don't want to go through the effort. A sporty car should be light, agile and uncomfortable. The Phantom Coupe isn't any of those things. The sports button makes the gearbox hold on to the gears for longer, as well as kicking down sooner and sharpening the throttle response. Compared to the drop head and saloon, the Coupe also has stiffer rear springs and dampers and a thicker rim steering wheel. The grip and progress are epic and allow complete confidence in its abilities. The bulk of this 2.6-ton car is hidden incredibly well and it does a good job making you think it's sporty. Body roll is kept in check by the stiffer setup, there's a decent amount of feedback through this gorgeous steering wheel and you never get the impression that the car will run out of talent before you run out of guts. But the real glory of this car has nothing to do with it moving. The interior is exquisite. The dashboard is made from one solid piece of magnesium so it won't squeak. It takes 17 days to upholster the car. And if what's under your rear doesn't impress you, then just look to heaven where 1600 fiber optic cables give the impression of starlight. As a means of transporting the super rich to their houses and yachts, this car is perfect. It lets you choose between ignoring the world in ultimate luxury or pummeling through continents having the journey of your life. It's not a compromise between luxury or sportiness, it is the perfect balance. Still to come on Fifth Gear Europe, we find out which premium coupe is quickest, the Audi TT or the Porsche Cayman. Plus, all the highlights from the Moscow Motor Show.
Moscow, the most expensive city in the world, and now home to the biggest car event in the world, the Moscow Automobile Salon. Soon, Russia will be the biggest car market in Europe, and as a result, the Moscow Automobile Salon is the world's most popular car event, with an estimated 1.5 million visitors. I wanted to find the best fast car and the best small car, and do you know what? I only had to visit one stand. We'll start with the best fast car here, the breathtaking Alfa Romeo 8C Spider. Just 500 of these carbon fibre supercars are being made, and 10 will come to Russia. We're talking a V8, 4.7 litre, 0 to 100 kilometres an hour, 4.2 seconds, and a top end of 290 kph. But let me show you some of the parts of this car which make it really special. For a start, look at this swooping front end. Quite futuristic, but also quite retro, and that looks like it's going to be the face of Alphas to come. And you can tell from the styling at the front and at the back here, look at these rear lights. They've transplanted all of the styling from this top end flagship Alpha and used it on their brand new Super Mini, the Mito. And the Mito just has to be the best small car at the show. Me for Milan, where the car was designed, and Toe for Torino, where the car is built. Now, engines are going to range from anything between 90 horsepower and 155, turbo fed petrols and diesels. Under there is a heavily modified Fiat Punto R bath chassis. Alfa are promising the best build quality and the finest materials available to take their fight to the Mini. We'll soon see about that. I headed off to the rest of the show to see what other highlights there were. What, why would you call a car after a cold animal? If you ever needed any more evidence that Russia is a country that's on the up, just look at this over Finch Range Rover. This is a British-built Range Rover. They take an already expensive Range Rover, take the whole car apart, and then hand reassemble it with the finest quality materials. This starts at £120,000. Ten years ago, no one in Russia would have ever dreamed of buying a car like this. Now, inside there is the finest quality leather that man can muster. But, in addition, we have a pull-out cabinet for champagne, which is quite nice, but that might not be enough. So, if you open the other drawer, oh look, we've got ammunition, and in there is a lockable gun box, just in case you need some booze and guns whilst traveling around. That's actually a really nice looking shiver though. And she's quite tall. I've come to the Citroen stand because it's the world premiere of the facelifted Citroen C4. I don't know what they've done though. I can't actually tell the difference between the first generation C4. Did that used to have chrome on it? I think the back window might have a slightly sharper line to it. Oh, hang on. It's got parking sensors at the front. I don't think it ever had those. I think it used to be like that, and now it's like that. That headlight is about an inch, or maybe a centimetre, shorter than the previous car. I've thought of something. So that hasn't changed. That's not a bad looking Chevrolet either. And she's quite tall as well. And this is the new Lada Sport. Now don't laugh, because Lada could be onto something very big. Skoda used to be a laughing stock, but then Volkswagen bought them up and made them into a very respectable brand. Now it could happen to Lada, since they've just entered into a $1 billion deal with the Nissan Renault Group. Watch this space. This is Great Wall's trade stand here at Moscow, and uh, quite an interesting name for a company, seeing as a wall is a car's worst enemy, like a hedge or a lamppost. But anyway, this is their new pickup truck. It's called the Great Wall Wingle, because there's nothing weird about those names. Another Chinese manufacturer, the modestly named Brilliant, had a number of new models, but they all looked a bit familiar. They're flooding the Russian market because Russian people just want cheap cars as much as possible. Doesn't it look like a BMW 3 Series? The Chinese are professional cloners. Hi there. Hello. Hi, my name's Johnny. Um, I've just been looking around the Brilliance cars and they, they just look like um, copies of other cars. No, this is not the BMW. And that, that one's even called the M3 Coupe, which I thought was a BMW. This is the first, uh, first uh, sport coupe from China. The very first sport very coupe. Fast from China is the M3 Coupe, not from BMW. There it is. Not everything at the show was a car or a copy of a car. My favourite exhibit of all didn't even have wheels. Thank you very much, Asimo. This is Honda's 
work of over 20 years. The most realistic robot on Earth. Look at that. That's just incredible. Fully operational robot that walks, runs, climbs stairs, gives you drinks. It weighs about 50-odd kilos. And just look at the realism of this creature. I am stunned. Is it real, though? I think it might be real. I think it's a child inside there. Thank you, Asimo. <laughs> I think it's cleverer than me, so I'm going to go now. Bye. If you're a maker of premium sports cars and you want to be regarded as the best, there's really only one manufacturer you have to defeat, Porsche. Euro for Euro, they built the best handling machines in the world. And this, the mid-engine Cayman, is regarded by many as the finest driving car they make. It's stiffer than a Boxster and more neutral than a 911. But maybe that's about to change, because this is the new Audi TTS Coupe. Small changes to the front bumper, larger wheels, deeper side skirts and four tailpipes are the only visual clues that this is the most powerful TT ever. And at nearly 45,000 euros, the most expensive. It uses a heavily modified version of the standard car's 2-liter turbo engine and delivers 272 PS. There's also clever magnetic suspension, revised steering, upgraded brakes and of course Audi's celebrated four-wheel drive quattro system to get the power down. But is it good enough to beat the Cayman? That's where I'll begin. There's lots to do driving fast with the standard Cayman because the engine performance starts close to 5000 rpm. Below this there's not much power. So here, third gear, 4,000 RPM, oh, now it starts. So you have to change gears very often. But changing gears in this car is, is good fun. This is the 2.7 liter base model, but it's still nearly 4,000 euros more than the TTS. It's also less powerful, and the 0 to the 100 time of 6.1 seconds is nearly a second slower. But that doesn't matter. Ah, uh, yeah, you can go a little sideways, but I think the electronics, they cut off engine power a little bit. Maybe it's for the angry housewife that she don't crashes. The Cayman is confidence-inspiring because its chassis is perfectly balanced and the brakes and steering let you extract every gram of performance. The brake pedal feels very good, so you don't have to rely on the ABS system. You can feel the limit of the car, and that's why it's great fun, even with the standard Cayman. <laughs> ah, I love it. Time for a fast lap. Oh, chicane. Little cutting. Yeah, and exit 444, perfect. Close to the wall. Ooh, that was close. Oh, yes. The Cayman crosses the line in 2 minutes 19.2. Time for the TT. If you compare the TTS to the Cayman, in every direction you have poor uh, communication with the car. For my opinion, the uh, steering is too light. There's too much power steering in it. So you can steer with two fingers. And that's why you cannot feel when the front axle's going to the limit. And that's the major difference between the Porsche and the Audi. Even with the TT Sport setting switched on, you just don't get the same feedback as the Cayman. I think the Sport mode is just for normal roads to Tell your friend, look, it's a sport mode. <laughs> okay, it's a sport mode. <laughs> but it's not usable on racetrack. The biggest disadvantage of the Audi is the exits of the corners because the car starts to understeer and then you have to lift off again. 
and this costs time. But the TTS has a better power to weight ratio and more grip from its four wheel drive. Will that make it faster over a flying lap? There's only one way to find out. Start the clock. Our first corner, hairpin, heartbreaking. Second gear, turning in. Lots of understeer. Yeah. Oh. At the first checkpoint, the Audi is behind by 0.3 of a second. Here she came. Come on. Okay. That fits. By the second checkpoint, the Porsche is leading by no 0.2 seconds. Fourth gear, straight. Four the brakes. Last corner. Full throttle then. But it's on the final straight that the Audi with its turbocharged engine has the advantage meaning that it crosses the line in 2 minutes 18.4 seconds. And in a shock result, the new TTS beats the Cayman by 0.8 of a second. The Porsche might be the more rewarding driver's car, but in the end the TT's superior power made it faster. Porsche should be worried, because rumor has it there's a more powerful TT RS on the way.